Good evening. It is my honor to welcome everybody here this evening um, for this exciting event. I'm Dennis Bartels, the Executive Director of the Exploratorium. And it's my honor and pleasure to open the festivities this evening uh, and to introduce to you here in a moment um, our Council General of France in San Francisco, um, Pauline Carmona. Um, but before I do, uh, and I promise I'm not going to steal any of your thunder about what the, the special part of this evening is all about and, and um, the incredibly important topic that we're going to talk about here at, with facts, sort of the French-American uh, climate talks. Um, but to um, say what a distinct honor it is um, to have it uh, here this evening at the Exploratorium and to work with the um, French Consulate. Um, for us, as you know, with this move, um, we made some big moves to really become more relevant in terms of one of the most pressing issues of our time in terms of science and society and policy, and that, of course, are all the issues related to climate change uh, and to the ways in which this is going to affect um, the entire planet and our existence as human beings over the next um, several decades uh, in, the, in the next century. Um, in this move, we were so, so pleased with the building and working with EHDD and many other experts. Uh, as you know, we have the largest solar array of any private entity in San Francisco on our roof. Um, we have a unique bay water heating and cooling system. And so to the extent that uh, there's a virtue of getting out of the you know, unusual heat here in San Francisco, 90 degrees today, um, and enjoy these comfortable temperatures is because of the ambient temperature of the ocean is being piped through underneath your feet as you sit here um, uh, in this forum. And of course, our grand goal, which is to become a net energy zero um, institution, which we're fine tuning and becoming very close to accomplishing, being able to produce all of our energy needs within the same uh, year uh, as we use it. Uh, I think we're also really proud of the uh, relationships that we have with a number of government partners in particular, all the different agencies around the world that are doing worldwide, real-time sensor information about our environment and climate and the atmosphere and the oceans with our Bay Observatory uh, there in the back uh, and our partnerships with institutions like NOAA uh, and certainly academic partners like the University of California at Davis. And finally, near and dear to my heart and anybody who hasn't had the opportunity, I invite you next time you come to the Exploratorium to examine the front gallery right here closest to us um, and a unique uh, uh, partnership we have with the National Science Foundation to do something quite novel, which is to see um, if we can actually help people understand some of the um, social sciences around um, why and when human beings choose to cooperate and when we choose to compete. It's called the science of sharing. Um, and what I love about it, what I truly love about this is for the longest time, certainly we've had the physical scientists talking about the dire needs and predictions and, and research that's going on in terms of really looking at our planet and what's going on in the physical sciences. But for too often, we forgot to include the social scientists who actually kind of know a thing or two about human behavior. And if the problem was as simple as explaining what's going on, then I think a hell of a lot more of us would actually be eating better and exercising more all those times the doctor told you that that was essential to your health. But when we talk about the planet's health, we think that the same thing happens. Just by saying it, somehow or another, magically, we eat better and exercise more. Human behavior, of course, is much more complicated than that uh, and tied up with, with uh, not just belief systems, but the way that we frame the questions, um, the way that we uh, personally experience um, our daily existence, et cetera. Uh, and so for us to include social scientists to try to help people understand phenomena like the tragedy of the commons or the prisoner's dilemma or other things that the modern social scientists have to share with us to help us understand why some of these problems are so darn hard to, to solve even when the physical science is pretty straightforward. This is part of what I love about what the uh, French government and the, um, the Council General have embarked on, uh, which is sort of a mission across the United States and France to gather up a very smart um, and um, uh, committed uh, people who have their own questions to ask, but to engage in a dialogue with one another to help better understand really what it is that we can all contribute um, in um, helping us to solve some of the, the greatest problems I think are going to be facing us as a species. So it's such an honor to be here tonight, and it's my great honor to introduce to you uh, the uh, uh, Council General, Pauline uh, Carmona, if you want to come up here, Pauline. 
Um, she just joined San Francisco a year ago. Uh, I got to, in, to be introduced to her actually at their beautiful residence up at uh, Parnassus, right behind UCSF, uh, where the Council General is located. Um, uh, the uh, Council General, before she joined us here, uh, has had many other stints uh, in the Council offices in Tokyo and Hong Kong. Uh, but for me, um, what I'm most impressed with is not only is she a, an incredibly articulate communicator, but I've also felt the passion and the heart that she has, not just for science and technology and the environment, but also for engagement, education, and learning. So Pauline, it's a great pleasure um, to let you kick us off this evening. Thank you so much, Dennis. Wow, and if I may, the, you know, the great commitment of all the staff at the consulate is to foster the friendship between France and California. So that's you know, our uh, constant and regular aim. So thanks, Dennis. Um, dear partners, colleagues and friends, dear internet users who joined and will join us on the web for the exciting sessions to come, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to be here tonight to give my first speech at the Exploratoriums, it's very exciting, on such important topics um, as sustainability and climate change. As you all know, the world leaders have a historic opportunity this year to adopt a new sustainable development agenda and to reach a global agreement on climate change. Both will have huge consequenci consequences for our generation and for the generations to come. So as you all know, I'm sure France will be hosting the climate change conference called COP21 in Paris this coming December. A few months prior to this key event, the hope of reaching a universal agreement has never been so high. You know, people did not uh, did not believe this, we could not believe this one year ago, uh, but we've really been feeling uh, the, uh, the trend and, and the commitment of many, many uh, more countries with the event approaching. Uh, so France is undertaking the role of president of the COP, and it's, he's committed to achieving a very ambitious outcome at the end of the conference, uh, which would take the form of an international agreement to limit global warming to two degrees Celsius. And I'm, I want to strongly reaffirm here our strong commitment to reaching a legally binding, universal, ambitious, and fair agreement commensurate with the challenges that we are facing and the expectations of our citizens. Because usually, you know, um, the, the commitment of the citizens is very far ahead of what the governments uh, are ready to do and are, 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 uh, are committed to do. So thanks to this, um, to the citizens, to all the uh, NGOs committed to this, I think now the governments are definitely following suit. Um, climate change is definitely a top priority for uh, French foreign policy and for the activities of, of all our diplomatic network. The, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Laurent Fabius, has really called upon you know, every ambassador, every uh, consul general, every head of the uh, uh, science missions in our network to uh, so in order that everybody plays its role in um, you know, lobbying and uh, preaching um, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the environment uh, agenda. And we've been working very hard through 2015 to listen to all our partners, so not only the governments, but the business, the association, the NGOs, to understand their concerns, to understand the national circumstances and their expectations for an agreement. And of course, to try and identify a common ground between them. And our country is really determined to facilitate the negotiations in an open, impartial, and constructive way. And so among the, all the actions, all the different actions that we've been taking, um, the French-American Climate Talks, FACTS, which have been initiated by the uh, Office for Science and Technology at the French Embassy in Washington, and the staff is, uh, is here today to, uh, uh, to take part to, the, um, to, to this meeting. So the FACTS have been uh, crucial as a key instrument of soft diplomacy. Since early 2014, the, this conference series has helped mobilize public opinion 
public opinion leaders on the issues of the COP21 and reinforce the dialogues between experts of um, the United States, Canada and France, all leading actors in the area of the climate change. As a leader in innovation and home to cutting edge organizations, of course the Bay Area is always looking to break barriers and create new solutions for building a better world. And the San Francisco chapter of the facts had no choice but to focus on how technology can or cannot help in the current climate paradigm. Our priority is to shift the focus of global efforts away from an approach of burden sharing into one of solution sharing. And we know we will only meet the challenge of climate change if we can also see it as an opportunity, an opportunity to innovate, to create jobs and growth, to make business, to improve energy security and competitiveness, and to create healthier and fairer societies. Our speakers tonight will show that social and technological innovation from individuals, communities, firm and nations can lead to mitigation and adaptation solution, solutions that are scalable, fair and cost effective. And the commitment of the whole um, climate research community, of all innovators to contribute to a long-term vision has never been greater than it is today. We have entered a new stage for climate science where the agenda of science is shifting. It's no longer exclusively alerting us to risks, but incredibly contributing to solutions. Um, and definitely this uh, issue of solutions, the agenda of solutions will really be a central part, a key part of the Paris conference. Uh, we need the COP21 to be the political answer to all that work, to all that scientific uh, policy, interdisciplinary work that we've been seeing in, uh, in France and in California um, these last few years. Um, we need the COP21 to show that the transition to a decarbonized and climate resilient economy is not just necessary, but that it is feasible politically, economically and technologically. And even beyond that, that it's inevitable and that it is already uh, underway. So thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to these uh, fascinating and very interesting talks tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Pauline. Uh, and uh, good evening, everybody. And welcome to this uh, 10th edition of the FACTS, uh, the French American Climate Talks. It's the 10th the uh, panel discussion we hold tonight. Uh, we started this initiative uh, a year ago uh, with uh, our embassy also in Canada. And we choose this name, FACTS, because uh, we say in French, les faits sont têtus. Uh, FACTS are stubborn. That's why we choose this acronym. Well, uh, before introducing our first keynote speaker, Patricia Beneke from UNEP, I would like again to thank all our partners who made this event possible. Uh, of course, the Exploratorium, and, uh, which is a great place to hold an event at the crossing of science and society. Uh, I like the, the, the phrase, the sentence written at the entrance, a place dedicated to awareness. I think it's exactly what we want to do with, with facts. And also, I would like to thank uh, Lazar, the group Lazar, uh, the world leading uh, uh, assets management firm. And John Knuz, I think, is somewhere in the room, okay. <laughs> will be our moderator tonight. And uh, Philippe will introduce him later. Uh, I would also uh, like, of course, uh, to thank one of the main partners, uh, UNEP, United Nations Environment Program. And I uh, will later introduce uh, Patricia. Um, but also I would like to thank all the team in San Francisco, of the French consulate, who worked hard to make this event possible. Of course, my colleague uh, Philippe, Philippe Perez, and uh, who has been here for one year now, and Pierrick and all the team, and I think they made a, a great job tonight. So uh, now, without uh, any further ado, I would like to say a few words about Patricia, but then since her career was uh, fantastic, I need my notes because I didn't learn my notes. <laughs> so uh, Patricia Beneke was appointing director and regional uh, representative of the United Nations Environment Programs uh, Regional Office for North America in DC in May 2014. Uh, prior to that, uh, she served as a senior counsel to the US, US 
uh, Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources for almost 20 years, uh, specializing on legislation and overseeing matters related to energy policy, water resources, and environmental issues. Uh, in 1995, uh, Mrs. Benecker was confirmed by the U.S. Senate as Assistant Secretary of the Interior for Water and Science and served in that capacity until 2000. Early in her career, uh, Mrs. Benecker was an attorney at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, where she uh, handled environmental litigation as an attorney also at the U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, Patricia Benecker holds a J.D. A degree from Harvard Law School and a Bachelor of Arts degree from uh, Iowa State University. Uh, Patricia, thank you very much for helping us in preparing all these events. You are participating at different events in different cities. And uh, well, again, thank you very much. And the floor is yours now, Patricia. Thank you very much, Pierre. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? So I decided not to jump up on the stage just like you did. Uh, <laughs> it could have been treacherous. Um, I want to start my remarks by uh, uh, stating several notes of appreciation as well. Thanks to Pierre for the introduction. Thanks for Mrs. Carmona, uh, Council General of the Consulate here in California of France. Um, and uh, also to Ms. Pham, who is the science counselor in the Embassy of France in Washington, D.C. Your terrific partners. We are thrilled to be uh, here tonight. And we're also very pleased that we're going to be um, present and participating in several of these events that you're having throughout North America. Um, I believe Washington, D.C., Miami, Toronto, Quebec, it's a very ambitious program you're putting together, I think a very worthwhile one, uh, and very exciting on the road to Paris. I would also be remiss in not thanking the Exploratorium for this lovely facility and hosting us here, and Lazard for helping to make this evening possible. Um, uh, in addition, I have a couple of people from my office, Fatou Doy and Adi Mohammed, uh, who are here tonight. And I hope after the event is concluded, we'll have an opportunity to all visit more. I said, gosh, maybe it's too bad that we don't just have a party here and <laughs> have a chance to all talk. It is a very impressive assemblage of terrific, uh, knowledgeable people in this room. And it gives me a uh, cause for great optimism that maybe, maybe we can make progress on this uh, tough issue. As the name implies, the United Nations Environment Program is the environmental voice of the United Nations. And our goal in our regional office in Washington, D.C. is to mobilize North American expertise and resources in support of UNEP's global program, the program of trying to improve the global environment. We're best known for our science and our assessment work um, around the world. UNEP and the World Meteorological Organization, in fact, established the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, and we house that panel administratively uh, to this day. Uh, we also publish a wide range of scientific assessments and global reports. One of the reports that is of particular interest to climate negotiators is our annual emissions gap report, which basically quantifies, if everybody does everything they're committing to do in terms of mitigation, how short are we falling in terms of achieving our two degree uh, goal. UNEP works on all aspects of global environmental matters, just, you know, every environmental issue you can think of in the whole world. But uh, we are playing, I think, an important supporting role um, in terms of the climate negotiations. That, of course, is being guided, that, that those negotiations, by the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change Secretariat. But we have a team very engaged. Um, we are working on analysis and data to help support the negotiations. And uh, we think that there is real progress being made uh, toward addressing 
this serious global issue. This is a landmark year for the global environment, um, and there are some very exciting things happening. Uh, I want to highlight one in addition to the climate change negotiations. I'll just talk briefly about it. But later this month, the UN General Assembly is convening in New York City, and they are expected to approve what is called the 2030 Agenda, the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. Many of you may recall that at the turn of the century, the UN adopted Millennium Development Goals. And these goals were intended over the following 15 years to help guide UN action in terms of international development. Um, 2015 having arrived, uh, those goals are now uh, behind us, and we are in the process later this month of adopting the agenda for the next 15 years. But what's particularly critical about this agenda is this is a sustainable development agenda. And that word is included in the name of the goals, sustainable development goals, and that's not by accident. For the first time, the UN is really articulating in a very clear way that this sustainable development agenda is going to make progress on economics, it's going to make progress on social matters, and it's going to make progress on the environment. And those three are so intertwined and intermeshed, you can't have progress on one without the other. So it's a very clear articulation of that, and I think that that is critical. In addition, uh, there are 17 uh, sustainable development goals that have been uh, set forth. One of them is going to include a goal on climate change. Um, the overarching goal is to eradicate poverty around the world by 2030. Uh, but again, all of these matters go hand in hand. Um, so that is one, I think, enormously important outcome that is going to occur hopefully later this month. It's certainly expected later this month. The second enormously important outcome is the culmination of the climate talks and the conference of the parties that will be conducted in Paris uh, late November, early December. Um, we, of course, thank the French government and applaud their leadership in helping to guide these negotiations to what I personally think is going to be a landmark uh, agreement and a successful outcome. The critical nature of the outcome of this conference on climate change was underscored for me, and I think many others in the world, yet again when the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration recently reported that July of 2015 was the warmest month on record in the history of record keeping going back to 1880. That is the uh, warmest month on record in terms of global surface temperatures, including both ocean temperatures and land temperatures. There's a lot at stake here, let's put it that way. But we do anticipate a landmark agreement and a framework that will keep the world moving ahead in addressing this pressing matter. So what's different this time around? What's different this time around? Um, you all, many of you, I think, have studied climate change probably for your entire careers and are, are, will recall that the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was approved in 1992. And the Kyoto Protocol was negotiated and agreed to in 1997. The Kyoto Protocol committed developed nations and countries in transition to market economies to achieve specific emission reduction targets. But you may also recall that that protocol became quite controversial in places like the United States of America. And the US Senate never ratified the protocol. I kind of remember that myself, having worked there. And in fact, uh, withdrew from it um, uh, subsequently. But this year, negotiators are discussing what has been termed a new architecture in an agreement. Under this approach, each country is uh, coming forward, developed and uh, developing alike, uh, to make contributions by setting its own plan, and these are called Intended Nationally Determined Contributions, or INDCs. There's an acronym for everything. Um, 
UNEP has been playing a role in helping uh, conduct technical workshops uh, to provide support to uh, developing nations in ascertaining or, or figuring out what their uh, INDCs should be and what they should look like. UNEP is also playing a role in helping to quantify uh, the outcome, assuming that these INDCs are carried out. Another thing, though, that is key about this approach is that it's universal. Everybody is coming to the table with an INDC, and hopefully the sum of the parts will take us a huge step towards where we need to go. So rather than a top-down approach, this is a bottom-up approach. And some uh, climate negotiators have been quoted as saying it's not the perfect architecture, but it's the best architecture anybody has been able to come up with. Um, now, I'm looking ahead here, but I personally firmly believe that the agreement in Paris, in all likelihood, will set the stage for increasing ambition over time. And that is very important. This is an ongoing process, and I think that, that we will see real results. And importantly, uh, the agreement in Paris will support accelerated climate action by global, national, and local leaders and diverse stakeholders. Now. I say all of this, the negotiations are ongoing. Uh, a session just ended last week in Bonn, Germany. The negotiators are scheduled to um, uh, get together again in October. So there are issues to be hammered out and matters to be resolved. But again, um, I am personally quite hopeful. So tonight's topic, what's the role of technology in achieving this? Um, I liked what the Council General said uh, about shared solutions. You know, that is really what we all need to be focusing on, and I think the brain power in this room can certainly help come up with some of those shared solutions. Um, the negotiators and signatory nations have always uh, recognized a critical contribution that technological innovation and cooperation will play in meeting the climate challenge both in developed and developing countries. And in fact, the Climate Convention itself requires developed countries to assist developing countries um, with technology acquisition. There's been a, uh, a, a, a climate technology center and network has been formally set up and is functioning. It's hosted by UNEP and the UN Industrial Development Organization. Um, it was created under the Climate Convention to provide technical assistance to developing countries and to foster collaboration among climate technology stakeholders. Some of you may be in the room. Um, we're always at UNEP seeking improved modeling and new and better methods to quantify the effects of greenhouse gas uh, mitigation. Um, so again, uh, the technological knowledge and know-how of those people that do modeling is crucial. And similarly, as adaptation looms, um, it's important to apply new technologies to address these matters, uh, whether it be with respect to sea level rise uh, or alterations to ecosystems and habitat, uh, impacts on agriculture, forestry, drought, floods, and the like. So technological developments to date, I don't need to tell a lot of you much about them, but efficiency and renewable energy have already been a tremendous help in addressing um, climate. Uh, UNEP is engaged with a broad range of these um, technologies. One is we have an Enlighten uh, initiative. It was established to accelerate global market transformation to efficient lighting, and you all know California has been cutting edge on efficient lighting, um, and uh, more than a billion people are already utilizing more efficient lighting due to um, this initiative. We're also working very hard to double the fuel efficiency of the global fleet by 2050. Um, about a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions globally come from the transportation sector. And the Secretary General has an exciting initiative called Sustainable Energy for All to double the use of renewables in the world, to double the rate of energy efficiency globally, and also to make sure that modern energy services are available for every person in the world by the year 2030. 
Now I'm gonna take another 30 seconds, although I know my time is up. I can't sit here in San Francisco without one comment about financing, because uh, I know some of you are heavily into that. Um, we are working with a global network of over 200 financial institutions um, on a topic called green economy. Um, all of these partners have a shared conviction that the financial sector has a key role to play in supporting uh, sustainable development. And in addition, we have an ongoing project which is about to come to completion this fall regarding the design of a sustainable financial system. It's examining best practices in markets throughout the world um, and, uh, and uh, emerging innovations as well. So, so through these initiatives, we found that um, aligning the financial system for sustainability is not some far off notion, but is already happening. So in conclusion, there's no better place in the world than right here in the Bay Area to be having this conversation about the role of technology in addressing climate change. Cooperation, innovation, and creativity will all play a huge role in helping to achieve the outcome that we need for our planet. So again, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm honored to be here and uh, look forward to the evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia, for this optimistic uh, approach. And I hope, like you, that we'll have uh, very good uh, results in Paris. Um, before introducing our second keynote, uh, Eric uh, Vettel, I would just also mention that if you're interested in the series of conferences, facts, which are, uh, of course, continuing all over the States, the United States, you may have a look on the website of facts, and, um, and you will have also links to the Office for Science and Technology of the French Embassy in DC. So, so our second keynote speaker is Eric uh, Vettel, uh, the current uh, president of the American Energy Society. And I had the opportunity to chat a little bit with him. And I, I learned that uh, this society has 33,000 members. So I'm very ashamed I didn't know the American Energy Society before, but now I will probably use more your services. Uh, Eric is trained as a historian of science and has published articles on the 19th century chemistry. Uh, 20th century physics and the biological sciences in the post-war period. I'm sure uh, we could learn a lot uh, about uh, climate change science from Eric and about the story of big scientists like Arrhenius at the 19th century, for example. Uh, his book, uh, Biotech, the Origins of an Industry, was a finalist for a Reader's Choice Award for the History of Science, History of Technology Society. And he was also the winner of the Alfred Chandra Award in Business History from uh, Harvard University. Uh, Eric Vettel received uh, his bachelor's and master's degree from Stanford University, uh, his PhD in history from the University of Virginia, uh, and was the Bancroft postdoctoral fellow in the United States history at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, from 2005 to 2009, uh, he served the director of the Woodrow Wilson Presidential Library, uh, followed by uh, in-residency fellowship at the Miller Center at the University of Virginia, where he turned his attention to energy. Uh, the energy transition to reduce our green gas emission is one of the biggest challenges facing mankind. Eric is going to give us uh, some insights on some of the available solutions uh, technological, but probably not only technological, to achieve this ambitious goal. Thank you, and Eric, the floor is yours. Hello. I, I too thought about leaping, but then thought better of it. Good idea not to do that. Thank you, a special thanks to the French Embassy in the United States, the sponsors, and the Exploratorium for this wonderful event. In the interest of time, I won't draw out my introduction and I won't test your patience with my terrible French speaking skills. Instead, I'd like to leave you with three significant and hopefully memorable ideas about energy. 
And I won't bother with evidence or data. We historians like to call this a survey. <laughs> the first idea will be an observation. I will try to put in a, into historical context the current era in energy. The second is a prediction. I will identify a current innovation that I believe has the most expansive and ever-changing potential to impact the world. <clears throat> and finally, I will rank the top five most dynamic research centers in this important innovative field, where if breakthroughs are to occur, these five centers will undoubtedly make critical contributions. I am the president of the American Energy Society, but I am also a historian of science. I have studied and written about chemistry and physics and biotechnology and energy. In short, my primary academic focus is the study of scientific revolutions. And as president of the American Energy Society, I have had the opportunity to travel to, visit with, and study the work of thousands of professionals in energy, academics and professional researchers, investors, policymakers, program officers, from Rochester Institute of Technology in the Northeast to the Scripps Institute at UC San Diego, with policymakers in Washington, DC, to investors on Sand Hill Road, with oil and gas prospectors in Sugarland outside of Houston to mechanical engineers working on wave and hydro technologies at Oregon State. I've had conversations with people like Ernie Moniz, Secretary of Energy, Captain James Goudreau in the Pentagon, graduate students in basements at labs all across the country. No matter where I go or with whom I speak, I am always impressed and humbled by the depth and breadth of talent across energy. It makes me hopeful that we are capable of achieving consequential change. Which leads me to my first point, a historical observation. I can say without qualification that in the modern era, I've never seen anything quite like I'm seeing right now. There is no normal. The entire energy sector is going through massive rapid change. It may not feel like it's going fast enough, but it is. Clean tech, bigger changes in oil and gas, the decline of coal, the decline in the total amount of energy consumed per cap in the United States, which was once considered unthinkable, and more unthinkable, the probable collapse of OPEC. And this revolution is just getting started. There are three billion people in the world who are un- or under-electrified. Three billion people who have ac had access to cell phones before they had an effective way to recharge them. Revolution indeed. <clears throat> A paradigm shift is certainly not out of the question. And even though I'm a historian of science, I am often asked what will cause that paradigm shift. It is not enough to say that change is happening. It is also important to clarify what is changing, which leads me to my second idea, a prediction <laughs> about the next big thing. I believe, you have to understand, historians aren't comfortable looking ahead. We are very comfortable looking back. I believe that the leading edge of the next energy frontier is small-scale energy storage, or what I might call personal storage units, on a community microgrid scale. Appropriate for an individual home, or an apartment complex, or to power cars, or capable, capable of powering villages or remote military outposts, especially if intermittent renewables are to take off. Historians of science often recognize that energy storage has been perhaps the most difficult technological bottleneck in the modern era. Battery, battery innovation has been flat, flatter than just about any other field. As scientists and engineers continue to struggle with energy density or high temperature stability, and without path-breaking advances, we have been stuck in virtually the same place for a very, very long time. Almost 99% of all electricity consumed is at virtually consumed at virtually the same moment that it is generated. I'm going to say that again. Almost 99% of all electricity is consumed at virtually the same moment that it is generated. Throughout history, humankind has lived in and been limited by this simple physical law. We've burned, diverted, and captured power that we have to use immediately. This has created enormous unavoidable constraints. The storage of energy is arguably the single greatest technological bottleneck in modern history, while the battery has undergone only minute or incremental advances until now. 
which leads me to my third and final idea. As much as I deeply admire democracy and its processes, thank you, France, the best science is not a democracy. It is a meritocracy. So people often ask me as well, who is leading the way toward the next breakthrough in any given field? In terms of research and development in the expansive field of personal or small-scale energy storage, there is great work happening all over the world, from Tesla, of course, to Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, to French companies like Energiestro, which is manufacturing flywheel energy storage devices. But these are the leaders of today. What about the leaders in small-scale energy storage in the next generation? Who is leading tomorrow's tomorrow, three to five years out? I will limit myself to the United States. There will be breakthrough discoveries all over the world, but this is where my knowledge of next generation innovation is strongest. My criteria is basically quantitative and qualitative. Grants and awards factor in, so do publications, but I also rely on anecdotal inputs as well as aura and feel. <laughs> that being said, my next generation leaders in small scale or personal energy storage, starting with a few honorable mentions. There's incredible work being done at University of Texas, Austin, Georgia Tech, Caltech, University of Maryland, it's a long list. But for my top five in small scale or personal battery storage, I'm gonna call it a tie between fourth and fifth place. And it has nothing to do with the fact that there's a member of the faculty on, from Stanford and Berkeley on the next panel. <laughs> so tied for fourth and fifth, at Stanford researchers are doing great work in grid scale storage electrochemical research and creation of new designer carbons that boost the performance of batteries, among other topics. At Berkeley, battery research spans the entire spectrum from microscopic to macroscopic. They're making great contributions to rechargeable batteries, fuel cells, and flow batteries. And I'm especially impressed with their development of new electrode materials and electrode architecture. Number three, halfway between New York City and Buffalo, there is a little known but top flight fundamental program in, the, in battery chemistry at Binghamton University. They might be newcomers to the field, but since they don't have rigid disciplinary boundaries, they've been able to create very productive interdisciplinary programs. And in 2017, they will open the Smart Energy Center, which will emphasize, among other fields, battery research. Number two, MIT. The breadth and depth of work at MIT is truly impressive. Everything from flywheels to thermal storage to seafloor storage, and they are launching a new center for energy storage. There is a lot of work on the periphery at MIT as well, such as the development of what they call egg and yolk nanoparticles, as well as edible batteries. Edible batteries. <laughs> and for the top research center in energy storage in the United States, I believe it is Argonne National Laboratory, primarily because of the batteries and energy storage hub at the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research, a multidisciplinary, multi-institutional collaborative project that is centered at Argonne just outside of Chicago. The depth and breadth of their work is too much to review right now, other than to say they are doing cutting edge cell redesign, system redesign, material and ion redesign. In short, keep an eye on Argonne. Sorry for that pun, for those of you that follow. In conclusion, obviously there is no guarantee that these or any technological development will be the energy solution for tomorrow. Innovation doesn't happen just because we want it to or need it to. Small scale energy storage may not advance at all and politics and policy always play a crucial role. But energy is the fundamental challenge for this generation. Jobs in the economy, national security, ecological devastation, these are important issues too. But energy is threaded into the fabric of these and many other issues. It is no exaggeration to say that energy is a challenge that this generation must address. But to address this challenge, we will need more than just research and development. In December of 1918, President Woodrow Wilson went to Paris, hoping to reach an agreement that would end all wars. It was a noble idea, but the world wasn't ready. Exactly 97 years later, in December of this year, the eyes of the world will once again be on Paris. Hopefully, we will have learned lessons from history and reach a universal agreement 
that allows the world to take full advantage of innovations that, that are in our best interest. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patricia, and thank you, Eric, for mind-blowing keynote speeches tonight. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Philippe Perez. I'm the science attaché uh, at the Consulate uh, of France here in San Francisco. Um, my role here is just to usher you in the second part of the, of the conference tonight. Um, to address the, the topic we've chosen for this uh, facts event tonight, uh, how to mitigate climate change and what's the use of technology and how to transfer technology uh, for a global deployment. Um, we've uh, tried to stay away from the classic formats of uh, long lineups of speakers uh, or traditional panel discussions. We've decided to go for the talk show style um, with moderator, of course. Um, it felt more uh, sincere and, and deeper, so we'll, we're going to try that tonight. Um, so on a very spe special, uh, especially one day to, uh, today in San Francisco, there will be no fireplace on stage, of course, but you will have two fireside chats uh, for tonight. One featuring two university professors, so Stanford and Berkeley, uh, and the, other, the, the second one with two amazing uh, entrepreneurs. Um, 20 minutes uh, chat uh, moderated, uh, so twice 20 minutes, uh, with 10 minutes Q&A. Uh, I know it's maybe, maybe uh, not enough. Uh, it will be frustrating, uh, so please save your questions for after with a glass in the hand. Uh, you'll have a chance to uh, answer, uh, ask more questions. Uh, I remind you that the whole thing is live casted uh, on the web tonight. Um, and to host and, and moderate the event uh, tonight, who else than Lazare, uh, uh, with, it, with its French roots, um, and also its unique lookout on technologies for the past 160 years. Um, so John Gnus is the director, the director of uh, Lazare here in San Francisco. Uh, Mr. Gnus has degrees in uh, physics, uh, philosophy, history, uh, and business. Um, he also sits on boards of uh, different uh, nonprofits, uh, including uh, Voice Choir Ensembles and Science Literacy for Kids. Um, I think he's overly qualified for tonight. Um, when Microsoft invests in Dell, uh, when Amazon acquires uh, Zappos, and when Google diversifies in health technologies, uh, Mr. Gnus is in the loop. Uh, so John, please join me on stage. Uh, thank you very much. As, uh, as mentioned, I'm, I'm John Ganussi. I'm a managing director at Lazard. I've been uh, with Lazard for, uh, for about 20 years. I, I did do a, a I want to uh, start by thanking the, uh, uh, the French consulate uh, for sponsoring this and a, a dozen other events, uh, uh, building up awareness for the, uh, uh, for the UN Climate Change Conference. Uh, I think it's only appropriate that uh, on a day that it hit 91 degrees in downtown San Francisco, we get together to discuss climate change. Um, and I'd like to um, uh, introduce uh, my panelists, although I need to get out their bios since I have them tucked away. Um, so pardon me one second. Uh, as I do that, I'll mention uh, I saw on the website um, for the for the talk that the that the that the French uh, embassy has a policy of uh, of making these conferences carbon neutral and pays for uh, carbon credits for all the travel. I just want to point out I, I walked here from all the way down the street, <laughs> and um, and I and if anyone got caught behind all the uh, the, the five ladder trucks out on the Arcadera, many of you may have uh, unexpectedly walked here as well. Uh, so 
Joining me tonight is uh, our, oops, I got the wrong one out. Uh, Jim Sweeney of, uh, of Stanford, who's the director of the Precourt Energy Efficiency S uh, Center at Stanford. And uh, he's a senior fellow at the Stanford Institute of Economic Policy Research, a senior fellow of the Hoover Institution on War, Revolution, and Peace, senior fellow of the Stanford Institute of International Studies, uh, his professional activities focus on economic policy and analysis, particularly energy, natural resources, and the environment. At Stanford, he has served as chairman of the Department of Engineering Economic Systems, chairman of the Department of Engineering, uh, sorry, and Operations Research, director of the Energy Modeling Forum, chairman of the Institute of Energy Studies, director of the Center of Economic Policy Research, uh, during the 1970s, he was director of the Office of Energy Systems Modeling and Forecasting for the U.S. Federal e Energy Administration. He has a B.S. degree from MIT, the number, uh, the number two or three um, research uh, institution in, uh, in these days in uh, energy storage. He's a Ph.D. from Stanford and uh, in energy economic systems. So please help me welcome Jim Sweeney. Uh, also joining us on this panel, um, uh, another incredibly qualified panelist uh, from across the bay uh, and across the pond, I guess, uh, Alexand uh, Alex Bayan, uh, who is the director of the Institute for Transportation Studies at UC Berkeley. He received an engineering degree in applied mathematics at the Ecole Polytechnique in France uh, and an MS degree in aeronautics and aeronautics uh, from uh, Stanford University. And a, P and a PhD in aeronautics from Stanford University. Uh, he was a visiting researcher at NASA Ames Research Center from 2000 to 2003. Uh, between January, uh, uh, he has worked as the, the research director in the Autonomous Navigation Laboratory at the Laboratoire de Recherche Balistique et Aerodynamique, uh, where he holds the rank of major. He is currently Associate Chancellor Professor and has been the Director of the Institute for Transportation Studies uh, since uh, 2014. He has authored two books and over 150 articles in peer-reviewed journals and conferences and the recipient of numerous awards, including the Career Award for, from the National Science Foundation in 2009 and the President, uh, Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers Award from the White House in 2010. Please. Uh, join me in welcoming Alex Bayan. So again, this is a fireside chat, although in California, uh, we cannot have a fire. Um, and uh, as, as mentioned, our ba my background is I'm an investment banker focused on the technology sector. Uh, and uh, with my colleagues from our energy sector, we've done a lot of work in the area of uh, alternative energy where we've advised the likes of First Solar, uh, uh, Terraform. Um, in the wind era, we represented Abnegoa on its, uh, on its sale of its wind generation portfolio. Uh, we've done things in next-gen tr uh, energy transmission, batteries. Um, and not waste any time on, a, on an advertisement. On your seats, you, may, you will find a, a study that we, that we release at a cadence of about once a year, which is called the Levelized Cost of Energy Analysis. And we've been doing this for about eight years now. You have uh, version 8.0. Unfortunately, due to the timing of this conference, uh, we are weeks away from releasing 9.0, which, um, which will be another year worth of uh, of data, and what's new in this, uh, in, the, in the new one, um, uh, Eric Vitell mentioned the importance of storage. For the first time in our new 9.0 study, we will do a, an analysis of relative cost of storage of different technologies, uh, ranging from, from chemical and grid scale and, um, and, and various uh, storages. So I think uh, uh, we agree that storage is, is potentially one of the major kind of breakout technologies. Um, and so feel free to leaf through this. If we don't keep your attention, I assume you will. Um, but um, one thing I um, want to start with is, uh, while we've heard some, some very alarming news about uh, July being the warmest month on record, and 
and every day there's stories about atmospheric carbon of uh, 400 parts per million, et cetera. Um, there's some very good news for on the technology side. And in this report, we show that um, in our analysis over the past five years, the cost of solar has dropped 80%, the, drop, the cost of wind has dropped 60%, um, and solar's approaching gr uh, grid parity uh, in various markets. On a given day, Iowa may generate 40% uh, of its power from wind, uh, and renewables accounts for about 70% of new power generation. Uh, also, things like the Tesla has become the you know, the sexiest car you can get, and it's no longer, and can outdrag rate, say, a Maserati. So being green is not just for a bunch of hippies uh, uh, or limousine liberals, it's now extremely desirable in many applications. Um, and now we have things like, uh, I spent the weekend replacing lights with LED bulbs. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and that, that said on, you know, they were very expensive, but they said that they would last for 22 years. Although in my experience, I, I, I was actually replacing ones that I just put in a few months ago, so. Um, so, Jim, so, so I've talked a little bit about, uh, about power, uh, about the production side of, of, of power. But knowing your research, I know you're going to say, we're focused on the wrong things. We need to be focused on, on the efficiency side. So can you talk a bit about the Precord Institute and what you're doing to analyze and educate people about the opportunities on energy efficiency? OK, let me um, not exactly answer the question that you want me to answer. <laughs> As, but I'll focus on the significance of energy efficiency. First, you know, the, the idea of all of the above that Obama has talked about is right. It's, it's got to be. That actually was first came under Project Independence report, and Project Independence said you've got to do supply and demand all of the above, too. So it, it's a good sequence of things. But if we look at the history, of, of, the de of the reduction in carbon dioxide released in the, in the economy, it's useful to use what we call a Kaya identity. The amount of carbon dioxide is equal to the amount of is GDP multiplied by energy per unit of GDP multiplied by carbon dioxide per unit of energy. It's just an identity. It's just a way of breaking up those three things. But it said, look at this, economic growth. We're not going, none of the countries are going to agree to stop their economic growth for, the car, for this system. Then there's how much energy we use per unit of the economy. That's the demand side. And then there's how carbon, how much carbon there is of the energy, in the energy. So you, so you can use it to think about what the effect is. And you, I go back to 1973 when there was uh, the oil crisis and we all changed our thinking about energy. We created international agencies. We created domestic agencies. And then we started a process of looking at the supply and demand side. We can ask about what the history of decarbonization is. That first factor, energy per unit of GDP, has gone in 1973 from 14,000 BTUs per dollar of GDP, inflation adjusted, of course, from 14 to last year it was six. So we've had about um, the carbon, the energy intensity of the economy in that time has gone down to about 45% of what it was in 73, a 55% reduction. Now the other factor is carbon per unit of energy. That's gone down 12% in that time period. So it's true that in the future, these carbon, low carbon sources are going to be dominant. We've got to really pay attention to it. But let's face the fact that right now, the rate of decarbonization of the economy is faster because of the efficient use of energy, Tesla is an efficient use of energy and a transformation of it, than it is for the decarbonization. For that decarbonization, I count wind and solar and geothermal. Those are the least significant. 
nuclear was a big one, and then fracking for natural gas was the biggest. So, long answer to the question, if you really want to focus on decarbonization of, of the, the energy sectors, don't forget the demand side of the energy market because that's where the action really has been in the past by a factor of 10 greater than all of the supply side options altogether. Maybe a factor of only eight greater than all of the supply side options together. Thank you. So we've got to focus on the right things. So Alex, tell us about what, what uh, we have one mic, uh, what Berkeley is doing in the area focused on, on energy, in particular what you're doing at the Institute for Transportation Studies. Well, I wish you asked a real question so I could have taken his license to not answer it. But um, I, I'd be, uh, yeah, actually, let me look at this problem from a transportation angle. Um, the, the, the question in the back is really, can technology hold uh, climate change? Um, if I focus on transportation, every American is spending more time in his or her car than on vacation. I don't know if these statistics would hold in France. <laughs> Longer vacation. Um, but I think what it, a, lot of the, a lot of the climate change issues we see right now um, are uh, due to transportation. And so in, in the question about you know, whether uh, we can invert that slope, I think there are three things which are very important to consider if you want to fix climate and if you want to fix the issues and the impact of transportation on climate. The first one is um, think about fixing transportation. Um, today, with the Internet of Things, we have opportunities we never had before. Um, fixing the demand problem in transportation uh, 10 years ago was the same as trying to drive your car to work without looking. I mean, today we can measure things we never saw before. Just with AT&T data, you can, you can pretty much watch mobility in Los Angeles uh, and figure out who is contributing to what congestion. This beautiful building has two sensors that can measure uh, the concentration of particles and carbon in the air. Th these are things that were not available 10 years ago. The second part is big data is also uh, providing a lot of uh, opportunities here. Um, you probably heard about the Uber issues in New York. If you want to understand whether Uber is really contributing to pollution and greenhouse gas emission in New York, you have to be able to run a simulation of the entire traffic system in New York. That's, that requires big data. That requires a lot of things we couldn't do 10 years ago. And the last one is policy. Um, Data-driven policy is something that is coming uh, to fruition. Finally, we can start to inform um, a lot of our decision makers about uh, ways to make decisions that are based um, in computations we couldn't do before. Uh, for example, in Los Angeles, you see people rebelling against Waze and Google because they create traffic jams in their neighborhoods. More emissions, more greenhouse emissions in, in, in places which never had traffic jams before. So you could argue that these companies that are providing beautiful technology actually are making things worse. And it's known if you watch the movie uh, Beautiful Mind with John Nash, um, you know what a Nash equilibrium is, and it, it is a case of a Nash equilibrium. So finally, we can inform politicians who make decisions about regulations and policy um, about these things. And I think one of the things I hope to have in the conversation is that there's policy on one end and there's markets on the other end. And, and you care a lot about market, Jim. So I think um, how these two play together to, to fix things. So spe specific to, so uh, Al Gore in his presidential campaign in 2000 had this vision of gr the green entrepreneur and that we can gr you know, create growth by people focused on lowering energies and, it, and that it's a, a economically sustainable. When you think about an Uber and, uh, or, a, or a Waze where you have entrepreneurs giving directions does that model where you have individual companies kind of competing on directions? I have, I have an Audi that has Google Maps built in, and then my iPhone has Google Maps and, my, and Waze, and all three tell me to go a different way to get to, one says take 280, one says 101, and it's all from the same company. So, but you have different companies that will, that will, one will say go this way, one go that way. Will the free market work when you're doing kind of these big data applications, or is there a role for academia and governments and others to kind of organize and make sure we're collectively efficient as opposed to individually efficient? The, the, look, you, you need a combination of policy and markets and, and human behavioral choices and just collective attitudes. You're talking about a group of apps, none of which were designed 
to reduce carbon dioxide. They were all designed to make it individually attractive for, 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 for people. And when you have congestion phenomena, we know that each individual optimization does not optimize the system. So that's not going to optimize it. But what we have had things, and in, in now a policy action that's really been more, probably more significant than any of those, is the CAFE standards, the Corporate Average Fuel Efficiency Standards. In 2000, me, 1973, the average car on the road got 12 and a half miles per gallon. That's eight gallons for every 100 miles you drive. The current cars on the road, cars and, I mean cars and trucks, SUVs are counting in it, um, get an average about 25. That's four gallons per every mile you've driven. We've cut in half the oil use and the carbon dioxide impact per mile of driving. To do the same effect, we'd have to get down to total carbon-free driving from now to have the same effect as we had from the time period from 73 to now. So that was a government policy. So I, I think right now, you, I'm sort of a free market guy, but let's be, let's recognize sometimes the free market works well, and sometimes it doesn't. And you gotta decide which is which and be willing to intervene when it's appropriate, but you're always also willing to get the right taxes and subsidies and prices going through the system. That's why I think we need a carbon tax, some carbon price, because you want the ubiquitous response to everybody pushing in the same direction from the carbon tax, rather than everybody going in random directions because there's no forcing mechanism. So I fully agree with the fact that yeah, none, of these, uh, none of these apps were created to really even help with congestion. I mean, uh, and so um, everybody wants to do the right thing, but um, uh, truthfully, if you look at uh, an app that is providing you the best route for you, by definition, it is designed in a way that will not benefit society. So then one, one might figure out, okay, so if people are interested in doing the right thing, um, maybe taking someone from the freeway for 10 minutes, and if you do it with enough people, um, would work. Um, so think about the average consulting rate of an engineer in Silicon Valley, maybe five, six hundred dollars an hour. 10 minutes of that person is hundred dollars. A freeway lane in California carries 2,000 people an hour. So just to decongest one lane by taking 10% off, now you're already you're talking $20,000 an hour. That's not sustainable. So um, based on this, then this is where we have to find the sweet spot between the market and the policy, just going back to the point you were making. So a phenomenal example of this is Singapore. Singapore has a very contained transportation problem. It's an island of five million people. Um, and the way they control congestion is by adapting the taxes, back to your, uh, your tax point. Um, and it's no surprise that in a place like Singapore, where the uh, political structure enables taxation in a very different way than in the United States, uh, you have system which in the 60s were already visionary. The ERP congestion pricing uh, mechanism in Singapore enabled them to regulate their fleet and today they're moving to even the next generation. It would be probably a dream to have this here where now by tracking every vehicle they'll be able to congest by actual road usage. And there is in California a committee stating on this and probably at some point we will move to that. Um, and I think, again, the holy grail in making this work between what is taxing and what is incentivization of, of people to do the right thing is finding that sweet spot between policy and the market. And if you were advising entrepreneurs on areas to invest, and you had categories historically, and it's been a very challenging market for, for, uh, uh, for a lot of clean tech, and they've been, but if you were to categorize them, you have kind of production technologies like solar and wind, you have kind of energy efficient devices, so uh, LEDs and EVs. You have kind of transmission and storage, so lossless, lossless transmission, storage that really uh, allow kind of time shifting and place shifting of energy. Uh, you could argue that an EV is a, is, is, you know, should fit in that category. And then you have things like command and control. You have information, big data, and analytics to do demand response applications. And if I'm missing anything else, please add another category. But where would you advise, you think, has the most commercial opportunities where you can actually, you don't necessarily require subsidies, you don't necessarily require 
um, uh, you know, policies to kind of stay in your favor while you do it? Yes. <laughs> Look, at, there's opportunities in each one of those. And, and what, what we've seen, if you go down in the Silicon Valley area, there, there were a few of the VCs, um, um, our Iron Press people, uh, who, who was f into green tech investing for a long time, um, did well in that, stayed through it. Then there was a peak where everybody got in there. Everybody, their brother, their sister, their aunt and uncle, they all got in investing. And most of them lost some money on it. And now most of them are out of it. But Ira and the same people who actually had expertise are staying in it. I think the advice I give is not that there's one of those that are the winners, but it really helps to know what you're doing <laughs> if you're doing those, the, making those investments. But there's really good opportunities on the supply and demand side, as measured by the fact that we've had innovations that have paid off, but most of those innovations were not predicted 10 years before they happened. They were some, the LEDs, well, it, five, seven years ago, they had the first ever leadership summit of the LED industry, where they had no idea on earth where they were gonna go. And now, you know, you'd be crazy to buy anything but an LED for your general purpose lighting. There's a lot of surprises in here, and there's a lot of, a lot of knowledge among individuals that, that push their way through. Take fracking. A lot of people are trying for it, only, you know, sort of Bill Mitchell and others made it work using technologies that other people have rejected. Same's true for all of those things you're talking about. Some's gonna work and some people are gonna get burned. I think good investments sail mostly on the value of the technology and their business model. So in a sense, it's like playing a dangerous lottery to want to invest in something uh, on an ideological ground. And I mean, maybe this is a difference between a venture capitalist and a foundation, but just think about, for example, you know, if everybody was taking transit, um, uh, obviously, if we found a way to create a company that could uh, shift people from less uh, driving cars to more transit, um, it'd be a great thing. I mean, in the US, uh, everybody loves transit and nobody takes it. I mean, that's basically the saying uh, in the transportation world. So at the end of the day, uh, I think um, uh, the side benefits of uh, new technology for the environment is probably something that comes after a good investment. And then this is, again, where the policy kicks in, is that when something is so successful, like we see uh, personal guidance on smartphones or shared economy for, um, for driving and so on, uh, how can uh, government policy uh, kind of help the market to steer it so that it doesn't completely mess up the environment? And let me just give one degree of specificity. I, I think the electric, battery electric vehicles will eat the lunch of all the internal combustion engines within the next 30 years. So I'd actually go for that. <laughs> so that's yours. So uh, one last question before we open the floor to, to questions from the audience. Um, Jim, your identity equation you outlined, which was that, uh, is that carbon is the, the product of GDP times energy usage per, per dollar of GDP times carbon intensity of the production of energy uh, starts with GDP. And while we uh, in, the, in the States have, uh, have enjoyed kind of 1% GDP growth for some years um, now, uh, there are parts of the world which are growing much more rapidly, although as of this month, not quite as rapidly as they were. But they're also growing their carbon footprint incredibly fast. And so while the US has decommissioned 200 coal-fired plants over the past five, six years, down from about 525 in 2009, China is adding one, you know, one a day. And Japan is, has, uh, currently has uh, 43 coal-fired plants under construction to replace the 14% of their power that came from nuclear. How much of our getting more efficient can, how, how do we deal with the fact that other parts of the world are getting much more carbon intensive and how, 
how do we manage that? Well, first, they're not getting more carbon intensive per unit of GDP. China is more, uses more energy per unit of GDP and is more carbon intensive. You compare China to France in terms of, of carbon release per unit of, of energy use, China is, uses about, releases more than twice as much carbon dioxide as France does. But France is off the chart lower than anybody else because of their investment in nuclear. So, so you, you will have those differences in intensity, but the fact is the developing world will continue to develop. And if you as a developed nation go say, okay, China, okay, India, Indonesia, and all of you countries in Africa, we don't want you to release more carbon dioxide. And the way we want we, you, us, you to stop is stop growing, stop developing, stop getting people out of poverty. Come on, there's just no way that that makes ethical sense, political sense, diplomatic sense or anything else. That's not going to happen. So the only action that's being debated is carbon intensity, energy per unit of GDP and carbon per unit of energy. And China's making tremendous commitments there. They've got a long ways to go. And, you know, I'm happy that the diplomats are coming to agreement that the Earth won't warm more, more than two degrees. Frankly, there's no snowball's chance, well, polite company, snowball's chance in Hades that it, they're going to keep that because the developing world's going to develop and there's no way you're going to tell them not to, sh nor should you. But what you can talk about is carbon, improving the carbon intensity of the economy, the energy intensity of the economy, and the carbon intensity of energy. You want to come on that, or yeah, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm just happy to say that I, I guess at a broader level, uh, the, the, the main difference between infrastructure development and operations is the fact that even in places like California, where um, uh, sometimes uh, the, the government struggles to uh, invest its in infrastructure. Um, operational excellence is really where these reductions will be done. So yes, you cannot tell countries don't don't develop or, 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 or slow down your rate, but uh, s uh, certainly at the age of information technology, one of the things that we will see is just with whatever we have, infrastructure, carbon intensive or not, how you reduce the, the footprint of the operations. And there's enormous potential here in California and the rest of the world for that. All right, so I'd like to welcome any questions and do we have a Okay, there is a floating mic, and there's a, there's a hand in the back. Hi. Um, at, the, at the previous UN conferences on climate change, it's been a real free rider problem. So William Nordhaus, a, a well-known economist, has suggested a climate club, and he uses game theory and Nash equilibrium and so on, but also just intuitively, it can, he demonstrates that you've got a real issue with free riders on uh, countries mitigating their own and holding back on their own climate change emissions. So he's suggested a climate change uh, or a climate club which would, uh, members would impose a tariff of say 2% of all imports on all non-members uh, to give them the impetus, the incentive which is otherwise lacking uh, to mitigate their climate change emissions. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Um. Bill's been a friend of mine for ages. I think his is a wonderful idea that won't work. Uh, first, uh, if you look at the economic incentives for each one to do it, um, actually one of my PhD stu students, Kate Calvin, tried to look at these things. And every feasible coalition she could look at, and she's actually done this as a theorem, um, provides incentives for it to split apart. Now, Bill's analysis depends upon countries seeing that there's a, a other supplemental goals uh, that go along with carbon dioxide. For example, in the in in the U.S., the the uh, carbon plan that EPA has asked for. If you look at their cost benefit analysis, they say, well, you don't have to count any benefits for carbon dioxide. It's just for the reduced mortality because of the other uh, co-pollutants that come out um, 
it's sufficient to get us to move forward. So Bill's plan depends upon that, but I just don't think that that, that is going to be a, a, a viable option in order to uh, get us going. Uh, that has nothing, to, and then we add into it, it is arguably against the World Trade Organization rules that we've all developed because we, over, ever since Brenton Woods, we've developed a series of rules that, that put limits on, on the ability for individual countries or coalitions of countries to tax others for whatever the purpose. Now, I'm not a lawyer, I'm, but, but there is, it's dubious whether his climate club would be consistent with the rules we've negotiated over many, many years for, uh, uh, for keeping international trade vibrant. about, uh, about uh, technology impacts on reducing the amount of carbon we emit, but there's, I, I read articles that talk about companies that are developing products and ways of actually using the carbon in the atmosphere to make products, and some of them seem a little far out. Audi is working on fuels, and one's working on um, carbon fiber, pulling it out of the atmosphere and actually making it useful and, and locking it in that way. Are there any viable companies? Do you see anything coming in the next 10 years that could have any kind of actual impact? Uh, look, there's lots of technology that's working. I don't know whether there's companies that are gonna be able to make significant progress about this, but there's, there's been, and I don't even remember the names of the companies, that some that is trying to make concrete building materials that are bringing that out. Uh, there's, there's others using uh, biological processes. Uh, it's very promising, but I haven't seen anything that, that is promising to in the short run be financially viable, but uh, a lot of these surprises didn't look financially viable until it was, and then somebody makes a lot of companies. I, somebody talked with me about putting a little bit of money into this little company called Tesla. I said, nah, nah, <laughs> it's not gonna work. But I was on the board of another company called Har Software that said, look at this software solution, big data, uh, dashboards, being able to find your carbon. Um, that may work because that looked very promising. Um, our last board meeting is when we dissolved it to give back 10 cents on the dollar to the investors. So the <laughs> frank, frankly, in all of these things, including that, you gotta think the rule of thumb, there'll be 10 losers for every winner. And if the winner is big enough, that pays for all the losers. That's true for the federal government investments. That's true for venture capital investments. I think that's gonna be true in these things that bring carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. There's gonna be a lot of losers, but you know, I'm, I expect that there'll be one or two big winners at the end of the time. But I don't know what they'll be. So we talked a bit about the role of government versus uh, companies. So this is almost a, is a geoengineering question. So at the corporate level, there may not be enough that individual companies can do to capture enough carbon in, in a building product. But if, you know, at 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide going up to parts per million a year, where deemed safe is something like 350, is there a point in which we need to think about a, you know, governments getting together and doing some kind of massive geoengineering exercise? Is that even technically feasible? I'll do the first part and you can do the second. Well, going back to your question as well, is uh, other things that we've heard about is uh, uh, concrete that absorb uh, carbon. I'm uh, Part of my appointment is in the civil engineering department and this has a lot of promises. I think the, the point here is also very clear is so the financial viability is at this point 
quite uncertain. But I think the, the, the time when the governments get together is it's hard for a set of governments to mandate um, scientists to make a new discovery of this magic fiber that will absorb it all. But it's easy for the government to rule out a lot of things that um, are done freely by companies and are damaging to the environment. And so this is where it really takes a lot of political courage. At some point, maybe some government will stand up to Google because um, they will determine that maybe Google is causing a lot of damage by rotting people a certain way. Um, you saw what happened in France. It takes uh, two taxi drivers uh, to beat up an Uber driver for the government to wake up and, and put the two uh, directors of Uber on trial. So uh, I think the time when these governments get together is when things happen. And I think, uh, I don't know what that PM level will be before it happens, but it will happen. And, I see it happening way uh, earlier in on the operations side than on the sequestration side. Okay, in the geoengineering issue, that's that's a very tough and controversial issue. And the basic notion of geoengineering is can you do something that will uh, directly intervene in the amount of uh, insulation or uh, radiative forcing that we have for a given amount of carbon dioxide. People have talked about some schemes which when you look at are really crazy you never want to do and that's, that's uh, uh, putting, putting in uh, a lot of particles, uh, uh, metal particles in, in the ocean to to uh, create uh, a growth of uh, algae, algae blooms, which will then bring carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. When you start looking at the environmental consequences, that's really scary. Uh, but there's other schemes that people are, uh, uh, have been dealing with is uh, bringing, bringing uh, large atmosphere uh, airplanes up into the upper atmosphere and releasing, releasing um, water vapor in order to, uh, to reflect some more of the atmosphere. There are tremendous geopolitical issues associated with what country gets the control, ability to control the benefits and costs of the world of climate change. There's a lot of technical question. But I think that, that we've been sticking our head in the sands by not doing enough research in those areas because we don't know the rate at which climate change will proceed. We have the best guesses, but if you look at all the various models, there's a wide range of uncertainty. We just know it's getting worse and worse, but there's a wide range of uncertainty. And there's a lot of uh, uh, positive feedback loops that could accelerate the process. So we need to, if it turns out that it's getting worse a lot faster than we think, we need to bite the bullet and be able to do something. Well, in order to do something, in, and probably geoengineering, because mitigation is not going to be fast enough to do geoengineering, you better want, have done a lot of the research and trials ahead of time, or else you're really playing with fire if you try to implement globally a technology that you've never tested in small scale. So I think we should be spending a lot more R&D and effort in getting those, knowing about what would work and what will work in geoengineering, not to implement it. But if, if carbon, climate change starts going a lot faster than we're projecting, and it's possible, then we want to be able to do something without that being just a global experiment on the only world we have. Uh, uh, one right on the, on the panel right there. Oh, um, so autonomous cars are alleged to um, reduce the number needed and the number of parking spaces by like 80% and the number of trips, so probably not too much, but the uh, the total carbon footprint by quite a bit. Uh, do you have any comments? Well, the good news about automated cars is that um, I could say one thing and an expert could say the quite opposite and there's no way to verify. Um, so the truth is about automated driving is that uh, I've seen all possible of figures. I mean, one way to look at it is, sure, um, with automated driving, you're going to reduce congestion to 0%, which 
was proven to be false 15 years ago. Another way to look at it is that your automated driving car will be waiting uh, for you on the freeway for two hours because you don't care, you're not in it. It's suffering congestion for you just to pick you up. Um, so the truth is, um, automated vehicles as a technology, it's extremely hard to say whether these numbers are correct or not. And this goes back to the policy. It's not about the ability to have automated cars drive by themselves. It's about the regulations that will go with it. Most of the congestion in urban environments is due to, uh, particularly in San Francisco, are due to cars going around the block forever trying to find a parking spot. So yeah, with an automated vehicle, it could go on forever, right? And, and so you're not going to decrease um, emissions that way. So um, I guess the, the takeaway message about automated driving is that uh, whether it's going to have a positive impact or not on the environment is the way we're going to regulate the way the work. That's one of the things that uh, uh, we love at Berkeley. As you know, um, the first uh, automated driving tests were run in 1997. You spoke with Al Gore. He's the one who cut the ribbon. In 1997, Berkeley put eight vehicles platooned on I-15, and they drove by uh, having all the drivers uh, put their hands out of the window for the first time. Today, when Google <laughs> is certifying their vehicles, um, we do it with them because we don't DMV does not know really how to certify an automated vehicle. So when you now start to talk about operations, when maybe we have 10% or 15% of the fleet of our vehicles uh, automated, uh, we've not even started defining what are the policies so that when they hit the street for real, they have a positive impact on traffic and on carbon emissions. Uh, that's an open field of research, and, and ITS uh, works very, very actively in it because um, we need to do it. So just expanding, I'm in complete agreement, just expanding one little point. Let's say you were thinking about where to live and you had an autonomous vehicle as opposed to driving in. And you can now spend your time completely productive or you can play World of Warcraft when you're coming in. Whatever you, whatever you like to be doing, your time cost has dropped dramatically then maybe you might be willing to live a long ways from work and get a lot of your work done with your autonomous car vehicle, uh, driving. So that's a scenario where you, this may greatly increase the amount of vehicle miles traveled. I also don't know because I see scenarios that go in either direction. So uh, with that, we're at the end of our time. So, it's, so, so, it was, so Sebastian Thrun of Stanford gets a lot of credit for the pioneering the Google autonomous car, but it was actually Berkeley. It was the genesis, I guess. Well, so. a perfect uh, <laughs> demonstration of the nice and friendly uh, ecosystem in synergy, which we live. Right. Um, <laughs> so this has been a fantastic panel. I learned that uh, to really make an impact, we need to focus on energy efficiency as opposed to just low carbon, uh, uh, carbon in intensity production. I learned that the Internet of Things uh, is, uh, and the ability to measure all kinds of things and do big data analysis gives a whole new avenue for getting to a whole new level of, of, of low cost, of, sorry, highly efficient uh, utilization of energy. And I learned that uh, the academic says what we need to do is more research. <laughs>
an eco-solutions company. He has lectured on environmental engineering and design, as well as social entrepreneurship at Yale. Uh, Mike consulted for Apple on climate change and environmental toxins, and worked with Al Gore on, his pre on the development of an inconvenient truth, uh, and uh, which I think uh, generated a great deal of awareness on this issue in, in many of our minds. Uh, Mike is a lead accredited professional, a recipient of the EPA's People, Prosperity, and the Planet Award, uh, a, the Popular Mechanics Breakthrough Award, and the Business Week Idea Award. He earned both his BS and MS uh, in mechanical engineering from Stanford University. Uh, and so please join me in welcoming Mike Lynn. And it's and not on your bio, but you mentioned to me earlier you had studied at Yale in forestry and gender studies. Exactly. Right. So having gone to Yale, I can, I can tell you that he picked the, the order right. Mechanical engineering from Stanford and gender studies at Yale was the right, was the right match of uh, where to study. Um, and then also joining us is, uh, is Roman Lacombe, who is the founder and CEO of Plume Labs, uh, uh, which is a startup building tools to inform citizens of what they breathe and empower communities to beat air pollution. Roman, Roman is a former Silicon Valley entrepreneur, a French public servant, a World Bank consultant, MIT environmental economics research assistant, a Fulbright scholar and mathematics student, a fierce advocate of the power of openness who spent the past five years building open data policies to make governments more accountable in France and around the world. From 2011 to 2014, he was the co-founder and head of innovation of ETA, of ETA Lab, Thank you, thank you. Um, and the French Prime Minister's Task Force for Access to Information. Uh, at Task Force Ada Lab, Roman focused on policy delivery, startups, outreach, and international relations, representing his company in the G8 open data charter negotiations, and uh, coordinating France's recent adhesion to the Open Government Partnership. Roman is a graduate of the Ecole Polytechnique and of Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the number two or three school in battery storage. <laughs> uh, so please join me in welcoming uh, Roman Lacombe. Um, so we've heard, so in our earlier panel, we talked about the, uh, we talked about the importance of, or the, the, the significant impact on, on carbon emissions of the developing world. Uh, now, Mike, you, 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 your startup, uh, Phoenix International, is focused on powering the developing world. Can you talk about Phoenix International and what you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Um, and Eric actually set us up perfectly because uh, Phoenix is uh, a next generation power company with energy storage really at its core. Um, but not only uh, solar power to put into an intelligent battery, and then ultimately power the developing world, but also combining uh, microfinance. Um, so I have here uh, our device, it's called the Ready Set, and basically it's, it's an energy storage system that when you uh, power it up, it can run things like LED lights, uh, charge cell phones, and uh, basically run all the things and appliances that, that we've come to enjoy. And the notion is that you know, globally there's some uh, three billion or so people in energy poverty, uh, 1.3 billion people who have no access to electricity at all. And they struggle to charge their, their cell phones. There's some 600 million people who have off-grid cell phones today. And so as tragic as this is, this represents an enormous opportunity at the same time. And so uh, Phoenix uh, came out of this notion that uh, rather than to have uh, uh, candles and kerosene, you know, this uh, fireside chat of sorts that we would be having, you know, we could have it, you know, by, by LED light instead. Um, and that renewable energy will be, you know, the way that uh, folks will get there, but it's in part through energy storage and also energy efficiency that, you know, without the advent of these LED lights, the solar technology and the energy storage wouldn't be feasible at all. So the key technologies that you are, are integrating into this, it's solar panels, which have their own cost curve, which you can find in your little packets on your lap. Uh, battery storage, which if you down, go to lazard.com next month, you'll be able to download what the cost of battery storage is. Um, 
what are the other technologies that are focusing that? How rapidly are they changing? And uh, from this scale, which can power cell phones, you know, what applications can you power today? And based on cost curves, what type of applications can you power in the future? Sure, absolutely. The very first need is, is very clearly light, that folks are, are presently spending something on the order of uh, estimated $34 billion a year on kerosene, so effectively jet fuel, and putting it into small tin cans and putting a cotton wick in it and burning it as, as crudely as um, you know, a kerosene lamp from Bonanza. And, and this is the way that, that 1.3 billion people currently light their homes, and, and that very much is the first need. Um, but then incredibly, it's, it's cell phone charging, and uh, it's this incredible declining cost of, uh, of cell phone technology, and also the speed at which you know, they're operating now enables folks to be able to um, not only pay for this thing um, with cash, which was originally um, you know, how we launched this product, but now actually finance it. So microfinance is being combined into renewable energy to take um, an ever-declining cost of a product. So, so right now about 200 US dollars is the retail price. But you can break that down into just about $15 for the deposit, and people can pay as little as uh, 20 cents a day for this, for this energy system. And so in the future, you know, where things are going with declining cost of solar, improving battery technologies and energy efficiency, we'll see people you know, improving the quality of their life through water purifiers that might use infrared uh, or ultraviolet LEDs. Um, and also refrigeration to help you know, take the, uh, the food that they're able to produce and not have to consume it this very instant, but you know, be able to have it stored just like energy. You know, if 99, imagine if 99% of the food generated had to be uh, you know, consumed that very moment. Uh, and Roman, can you talk a bit about Plume Labs and, and what you're focused on? S certainly, and <clears throat> well, let, let me so I start by, uh, by, by um, well, thanking you for, for your uh, invitation. And if we, if we take a step back and, and wonder about why we're here, um, I mean, certainly it is quite uh, fresh, which is a nice break from the 90 degree uh, heat outside. Uh, but we're here because this question of how do we, how do we halt uh, climate change is an incredibly complex one. It's, it's uh, of course, been something most people here may have worked for worked on uh, their, their, their whole uh, career. One of the reasons why it's so hard um, is because of the scale of the issues that are uh, involved. Uh, so to the, to the question, what can we do with technology and can technology halt uh, all climate change? Um, the answer will be certainly not, uh, at least on its own. Uh, right when we when we look at transportation, we have to also add uh, systems thinking uh, that, that uh, Alex Bayon was was referring to. Um, when we look at um, uh, the coordination of, of of policies, we need to add um, uh, diplomacy. We need to add um, p policies in climate change that require the coordination of nearly two hundred chiefs of state with differing agendas, differing uh, constraints at home. So it is an incredibly hard issue, and that the. Uh, core of this is the question of why do people care? Why would I care uh, enough to change my behavior um, about climate change? And the, the problem is that there's a fundamental disconnect between your short-term uh, incentives when you use energy systems, when you use transportation, and the impact that you feel that it will have on your quality of life. Uh, it's the exact same problem uh, with you know Waze and, and Google and, and uh, uh, um, the, the uh, local optimization of your itinerary that does not help uh, optimize the global system. Now, there's a very interesting link between uh, our uh, emissions and uh, the uh, direct impact it has on, 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 uh, on our lives, and that's air quality. So, so to a large extent, climate change and air pollution are different uh, topics. It's not the same gases necessarily. It's not the same processes. The chemistry is different. But when you burn... Uh, uh, so f fuel and you emit carbon, usually you're going to end up uh, emitting air pollutants. And that is the missing link between um, personal incentives and uh, the global uh, impact of our collective behavior on uh, climate change. Uh, and when you start looking, um, lo looking at the uh, impact that air quality has around the world, uh, it is actually more than an environmental crisis that the world is going through. It is literally a pandemic. Air quality has become a pandemic. It has a medical impact that's just staggering. 
Um, the World Health Organization estimates that about 3 million people die every year from uh, uh, the complications linked to obesity. Uh, 6 million people die from uh, direct and indirect causes uh, of tobacco and smoking. Air quality is 7 million people. So there are 7 million uh, um, deaths that could be avoided worldwide just because of the quality of the air we breathe. And that includes, of course, the kerosene and the, uh, the, the lightning uh, technologies that, that we, uh, we, 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 we uh, mentioned indoors. It uh, uh, includes, of course, uh, countries where air pollution reaches levels that are so high that you can barely see the building on the other side of the street when you go, <laughs> when, 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 when you go out. Uh, but even in, 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 in countries uh, like, like France, for instance, in Paris, uh, where, where I come from, adults lose about six months of life expectancy just because of particulate matter. So the size of the issue is, is staggering, and most, um, uh, most air pollutants are uh, much more local in their impact uh, than uh, CO2 and its greenhouse gas impact that's much more distributed. So there's a very interesting thing here, which is uh, the impact is much more direct, uh, the um, link between what we're doing and who's suffering from pollution is also much more direct. Uh, so if we can inform uh, citizens on what it is that uh, they are breathing exactly, we're both giving them a tool for awareness that will lead political change and also a way uh, to avoid the excess exposure uh, to those pollutants. Uh, and because air pollution changes much more than we usually think, uh, hour by hour during the day, it can vary by factors of two, three, four, five in a day on a regular basis, uh, much more from place to place, city to city. Um, having access to a better, more personal information on what it is that we're breathing and uh, our exposure to uh, environmental pollutants uh, li literally empowers uh, individuals to change their behavior, not only to emit less, but also to uh, avoid uh, excessive exposure right when you're at the peak in the, in the middle of the day. Um, and so this is what we're building at Plume Labs. We're gathering uh, data from open government sources around the world, and that's a policy that I think we refer to uh, government innovation and govern governments having to step in into, the, into the, the, the mix of solutions we're bringing to climate change. That's a very interesting way in which governments can contribute, making data more accessible. We're building this global data platform uh, to track how uh, air pollutant levels change in major cities around the world. Uh, and we're building uh, an AI model uh, that takes historical data, uh, weather patterns, uh, all the, the, the information you, you can imagine uh, in order to predict how pollution is going to change. And that seems very simple, but if you're able to give a more accurate representation of how air pollutant levels are going to change in a city, uh, for a lot of people, uh, be they um, sensitive to air pollution because of health issues, be they uh, specifically exposed because they run a lot or they uh, um, you know, come uh, uh, by foot to conferences and <laughs> at the street level, um, be, be, be they exposed for specific reasons, then you're actually giving them tools to uh, adapt the time and the day in which they're going to go out, they're going to be uh, out and about and exposed to pollution. And that means mechanically decreasing the level of exposure. So what we're trying to build is uh, better information to let people take action to protect themselves against the ill effects of air pollution. And uh, to me, it's a very um, important thing at an individual level, uh, giving actionable information for uh, consumers, for citizens. Uh, but that's also one of the ways international and global negotiations can become better. If we look at what's the local impact, what's the immediate uh, issues with climate change, then we'll be able to change uh, incentives and then drive behavior change. So, d so pollution data, is, uh, and the environmental uh, uh, metrics like that, it's very, it's, it's, for, for the average lay person, it's a very complicated factor. I used to, uh, you, you check the weather, you know what temperature it is, it's going to rain, it's not going to rain. But pollution, I lived in Beijing in, in 1995, and it just, it was nasty. But uh, you go there today, and everyone has the iPad app or the iPhone apps, and they know particulate matter of this size is this amount, and particulate matter. It's very technical and sophisticated. Um, my, uh, there's a there's clearly a much greater awareness now of of uh, a particulate matter and different levels. But there's a my 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 daughter, my 11 year old daughter came. She was doing homework this weekend, and she her question was. When calculating parts per million, why is it important to use uh, dry air, to convert to dry air? I should have had this, I'm going to have to take you aside afterwards. 
Uh, and I had no idea how to answer this question, you know. So it's very sophisticated stuff. There's a greater deal of awareness about it, clearly. How do you make it easy for people to understand what it, you know, what does that, what does 20 mean? What does 15 mean? And, uh, and also, what do the, tie it back to the drivers? What's causing the pollution and how can we change behaviors to stop it? So to a large extent, I think that question boils down to uh, another discipline that we have to call upon, technology, of course, policy, um, diplomatic negotiations. But one of the very important issues here is uh, how do we use design uh, and user experience of day-to-day -day products to make it easier uh, to build sustain sustainable models and, and products and services. Uh, and if we can build uh, by design into our transportation systems, uh, into uh, the apps that bring us from place A to place uh, B, and, and, and uh, the services that we use in, 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 in cities, then we will make them uh, more easily accessible uh, and more efficient to some extent. Um, and on the question of, of air pollution, I think that the, uh, the question of the awareness is one thing, but then how do we make information actionable? And that's when you need to uh, very immediately communicate, is this bad for me or is this, is this okay? Uh, there's, there's a lot of work uh, that's being done by uh, public health researchers. There's a lot of work um, that, that uh, epidemiologists are doing. It's actually helping to see um, products like um, Apple Health Kit going out because now we have access to uh, a very large scale uh, amount of people that are exposed to, to different things. So I think uh, public health will evolve around these topics uh, in the years to come. Uh, but if we understand, as we understand better uh, how the different uh, types of pollutants uh, affect individuals uh, on a short-term, long-term basis, uh, then the question becomes how do we communicate it uh, so that it becomes easier. So the, the, the uh, a choice we've made with, with the Plume Air Report, so our, our urban weather uh, and air quality forecast, um, is to start with um, a global reference, what the World Health Organization says is you know, dangerous, as a sort of yearly exposure level and what's dangerous for daily exposure level. So it's a much more immediate uh, aspect because if you don't make things uh, simpler and more easily uh, understandable, uh, then all we have is data, all we have is figures. They're interesting, but they don't help uh, consumers take, take action. And I guess at a broader level, um, that, that raises the question of uh, what are the levers for uh, action that we give uh, to, uh, to, to consumers, to citizens, to users of uh, you know, public transportation systems or, or, or generally speaking transportation systems um, to uh, avoid contributing to, to the issue and being a victim to the issue itself. Uh, and so again, that comes back to the discipline of design, discipline of uh, user experience uh, of, of these different products and how do we give options, um, how do we um, in, 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 a, in a way, uh, architecture choice so that individuals in a system can make uh, choices that are efficient not only for them but on a more global basis. And I, I love the example of transportation because it's one of the ways in which we, we, we see how cities can become more efficient uh, if we ask the questions of regulation early on. So Mike, you've got a commercial product that you're selling in, a, in fast growing emerging market, emerging economies. Uh, you worked with uh, with Al Gore, who had said, you know, who had this vision of the of the green entrepreneur. We heard in the earlier panel what a big impact things like you know regulations like cafe standards have. Should we be focused on entrepreneurship and and as the driver, or should we have regulation, or is there a good symbiosis between the two? Um, I, I absolutely believe it needs to be some kind of symbiosis of the two in that you know, I'm, I consider myself a free market person just like Jim, but at the same time you need to have the proper policies, uh, taxes, and also incentives, carrots and sticks, all in the same place at the same time. And uh, you know, we can't sit around as entrepreneurs to wait for these policies and we're certainly not in a position to perhaps even lobby for them you know, being startups, but what we can do is you know, look around us and see the market opportunities as, as they, they kind of stare us in the face and that it's uh, the rare few who see some sort of glimmer, some sort of indicator that no one else sees is, gives us that competitive advantage. And if we can innovate then a product that can capture that advantage, then that's how you begin to see this disruptive change. Just like how you know, these reports may not have been able to predict when something was going to move the needle 
um, even just a few years before, they, they did move the needle. Um, and so for us, when we were looking at the opportunity, um, my co-founder Brian Wachowski is out there in, in, in the audience, and Brian was at Apple for a number of years building uh, the iPod manufacturing team. And Brian comes with you know, years of uh, uh, experience. He comes from the number two energy storage uh, university as well. And uh, you know, it was about smart people having the, the kind of uh, the magnifying glass looking in places where nobody else was looking. And uh, we had the great fortune in uh, 2008, 2009, when uh, Brian and I were, were working with the One Laptop Per Child Initiative folks, people who are looking at, looking at the incredible you know, rate at which computers are becoming more affordable and asking the question, could we actually build more affordable computers for folks um, in Africa? And give to them access uh, things like Wikipedia and every single textbook in the world. They wouldn't have to worry about getting textbooks out there. And uh, when we're out there, you know, looking at these laptop opportunities, we realized there was just no place to plug them in. And uh, that was the first insight. And as we looked even further, we saw people sending text messages and, and downloading ringtones. And before we knew it, you know, there's 600 million off-grid cell phones. And it was that insight. Um, there was no, um, say, specific uh, charity or NGO handing out free cell phones. Uh, but there certainly was interesting incentives and policies around um, selling out the spectrum and creating an economy where uh, these global telecoms like Orange, one of our investors, and Vodafone, MTN, could operate in these markets. And before you knew it, there was this cell phone revolution and they leapfrogged uh, all the wired telephone infrastructure. And so the opportunity we see now is, could you leapfrog the entire wired grid infrastructure and actually develop the ungrid? You know, having lots of distributed, decentralized energy storage systems and power generation from solar, but perhaps even wind, micro, hydro, even a bicycle, if somebody could pedal and produce energy and put it into the battery for, for usage. And, and I think that's where some proper mix, to bring it back to your question, of having um, entrepreneurship uh, capture the opportunities and then have policymakers now make sure that uh, they don't impose a tax or tariff on solar in East Africa. Right now there's uh, zero duty tax or tariff on solar. Um, but imagine if they put that in place, it'll dramatically change the economics uh, for, for the worse. Uh, so we heard uh, Eric uh, talk earlier about the concept of the microgrid storage, but this device appears to me to be the epitome, the ultimate extreme of microgrid storage. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of nano or pico or however far, far down you want to go. Um, but the really beautiful thing is that it's uh, designed and appropriately scaled for that consumer. Um, it meets their needs, and as they build a... Uh, a credit history with us as they make these little micro payments. You know, as they to, to explain how it works, they take the home, uh, the device home for a small deposit, and they use their cell phone uh, to text message us money as little as that twenty cents a day, and we'll text them back a code. And it's almost kind of you could think of it as prepaid utilities, where when we text them back a code, it unlocks the system and gives them access to power for that day, or that week, that month. They can pay in any increment because you know they're very poor, and oftentimes they're living um, <laughs> hand to mouth and you know, growing a few tomatoes and selling it at market, and they get a few cents. And the notion is that this uh, new kind of pico grid of sorts is comprised of all these little devices around the world, and they're building a credit history, they're, they're generating equity as they're buying this device over a course of some 18 months or so. And once they've paid it off, they can actually continue to invest in it and add a second solar panel, a third panel, continuing to build and grow it eventually, you know, the hopes is water purifiers and refrigerators and all of the great things that we enjoy. So it's kind of a solar city kind of business model. You give them the device and then they pay you for years to come as they use the device. Absolutely, and it is uh, a great analogy because solar city and uh, Sunrun, all those that are innovating the residential and even commercial energy space here in the US, you know, we're able to take that you know, many thousands and thousands of dollars of upfront cost and make it immediately manageable. So the moment that somebody takes this home, uh, they're in the black, they're profitable because they're uh, saving energy and they might even be able to build a small business off of it and actually sell energy to their neighbors who perhaps you know, can't even afford this device. So as an investment banker, I should advise you, you should take your receivables and put them in a special purpose vehicle and then and sell them in unit trust to the market. <laughs> Let's talk afterwards. So, <laughs> um, so with that, I'd like to open the floor to questions. 
and there should be roaming microphones or or just speak speak loud as you. Uh, for Roman, uh, if you're measuring pollution, uh, then you'll be focusing, I assume, on coal, which gives off lots of pollution and into uh, lots of CO2 when it makes energy. But won't that also have the indirect effect of driving people to natural gas, which solves a lot of the pollution problems, but actually could. Uh, if you switch from coal to natural gas, you actually increase global temperatures because you've gotten rid of the reflective co properties of coal, which is not, not necessarily a good thing. But certainly it's not a global warming solution. It's going to be about as bad as coal from a climate change perspective. So doesn't that, won't that have that indirect uh, negative impact of promoting natural gas? So I think it, it, it depends. That it, it, it's a question of uh, orders of magnitude, right? Um, certainly, there's a, there's a question of what the impact of looking at air, air quality from a global standpoint would have on the energy system and the choice of fuel mix, which anyway is not going to change drastically from year to year. We know how, and we, we just heard how uh, long term these shifts were in terms of. Uh, I mean, we, we're, we're even looking at, at energy history, right? Uh, and 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 how um, how long it takes for for these uh, for this fuel mix to to uh, to change. The question is, can we get to an agreement uh, in December? Uh, can we get to an agreement that will hold for the next few years? Can we actually build a trajectory towards uh, cleaner um, energy systems and, frankly, cleaner economic systems in, in, in general? And, and, uh, and we, we talked about seeing a market opportunities. Uh, there's a glaring inefficiency in the, uh, in the impact of, of uh, air pollution uh, on health and well-being. And if you look at the, 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 the health care costs uh, that this represents, I mean, it's, it's staggering. The French uh, Senate had a, a, um, um, a parliamentary uh, in inquiry, an investigation going on for the first half of this year. They released figures that estimate the cost of air pollution for the French economy. Uh, the figure they came out with is 100 billion euros per year. Now, granted, that's direct and indirect cost. It's looking at the impact on, on, on chronic um, uh, respiratory diseases that you know, add up over years. But it's a third of Greeks' debt uh, that we incur every year because of what we breathe. I mean, that's, that's huge. And so, so the, to me, the question is, certainly it's not the same issue. Certainly air pollution uh, and uh, greenhouse gases are different. There's different mechanisms. Some choices might be at odds. Uh, they're probably much less at odds than the choices between um, economic development and uh, sustainable development that we, that we mentioned. Uh, so it's probably a much easier um, diplomatic uh, vehicle uh, to make sure that, that we also see change in parts of the world where uh, growth is 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 is, uh, is leading to choices that have not been sustainable so far. Um, so to 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 wrap it up, I think it's one of those areas where, uh, and to me, when I started looking into the, 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 those those topics, it was just very surprising how much uh, it mattered and how strong its impact was, and how uh, underserved uh, uh, underserved the, uh, uh, the this this topic is. And uh, as individuals, if um, we're, so to speak, victims of this global pandemic, then how do we protect ourselves? And so what we're building with Plume Labs is an information product that makes it easier um, to reduce your personal exposure to the topic because you have better information. That's very much it. Uh, now it requires a lot of uh, uh, technology development. We're building AI models. We're looking at global modeling. We're looking at all sorts of atmospheric science and data science uh, challenges that are fascinating. I mean, quite frankly, it's I. We're, we're having fun building these, these, these products, uh, but what this means is it, it just makes it easier for all of us to, uh, um, to avoid excess exposure. Any other question here? Question for Mike, I'm just curious. Where, how did you identify your, you know, your first market, first location, and, and how did you go about you know, deploying there and, and you know, convincing people that you know, this is something they should do? Sure, yeah. So the first market we chose was Uganda. And in all honesty, it was serendipity. Um, we were approached by, I mentioned folks at Google who were developing the Android phone at the time. And uh, before the Android phone was available in Silicon Valley or in Paris, uh, folks in Africa were using it to uh, check real-time prices of coffee so that they didn't get, you know, um, you know kind of finagled by the middleman. And uh, engineers at Google had the, the foresight to, to see that you know, then the $800 smartphone would quickly you know, drop in order of magnitude to now where there's you know, 50, 80, $100 smartphones that are incredibly accessible and have uh, all sorts of incredible um, opportunity for them to you know, leapfrog 
the, the desktop computer, let alone the laptop and even the tablet to, to the smartphone. And uh, Uganda happened to be, though, um, chosen by Google because it was this interesting um, uh, kind of lab of sorts where it's uh, a democratic you know, society of sorts. It's a former British colony. It's reasonably stable, but incredibly, there's a massive, uh, there's been a massive investment in mobile technology. And so MTN is uh, Africa's largest cell phone company with about 230 million subscribers. And the South African company, which you know, none of us have probably even heard of before, you know, operates in 22 countries across Africa and the Middle East. And so they bring 4G LTE service to people who don't even have you know, running water or simple you know, sanitation. And so you would think that that's absolutely crazy. Um, and maybe it is, but people are actually able to use this technology now to uh, improve their lives and, and kind of provide for themselves and their families in, in completely interesting and transformative ways. And so as we look at new markets, we consider which markets have a very high rate of uh, mobile penetration. So the network and the towers are all there. Um, and yet an incredible low amount of electrification. And so right now, Uganda has, you know, they, they argue somewhere on the order of uh, more than 100% mobile penetration rate. And the reason why that is is people, people have more than one cell phone in their pocket. They actually have two cell phones and sometimes two SIM cards because it's uh, so affordable and it's pay-as-you-go and they'll, they'll kind of jockey for the best deal, the promotion at the time. So if Verizon is offering you a promotion to call between your network and, and your friends and family and AT&T does that, you know, that's, that's basically what they're doing. Um, and we're looking at uh, an advent in new mobile money services too. So uh, despite what Apple Pay and Google Wallet and, you know, the folks at Square are doing, they're actually leap and bounds uh, ahead of what we are doing right now in terms of technology where they can literally text to each other, you know, uh, as, you know a few cents just to cover, you know, that cup of coffee somebody bought you or to give someone uh, a gift for their birthday. So it's really exciting to see um, the opportunities, as well as how that ties into the, the climate change question. So we have time for one more question, right over here. Uh, one of the most dismaying uh, graphs that we see in this work is the population graph, when we see it kind of shooting up. So the population uh, in 2050 of the world will be 9 billion people, 10 billion people. You know, choose whatever uh, figure you want. But I, I want to talk about the interaction of that population curve and the availability of technology. Because if you Google the girl effect, you find that when young women and girls, especially in the global south, have access to education and to economic opportunities, which can be propelled in part by that lighting, what they do is they delay their marriage by several years, and they have 2.4 fewer children, so that dismaying curve that's going up this way can flatten out. And that can flatten out not just by providing them with that kind of technology, but also by providing them with a less polluting technology, which makes it m more likely that their children will survive. And if their children survive, women have fewer children to try to make up for it. So these, these two technologies that we have here really have promise for flattening out that really dismaying population curve. I absolutely agree, and I think I'm really glad that you highlight the girl effect because that's really a main focus of what we do, but you know, we aren't dogmatic about it. We want to lead people there and that they come to the same conclusions as you have um, because we're finding that it's women who are, in fact, actually the purveyors of energy within their homes. It's a little-known fact, but it's when women are home and caring for the children that they're out there gathering wood to cook tonight's dinner. And they're also the ones going out and purchasing kerosene, you know, the jet fuel in little plastic baggies, like a Ziploc bag, a few, you know, ounces at a time. And so we're actually transforming the gender landscape because women and girls are actually those who are using these systems when traditionally they're gender biased. You would think that, oh, electrons and transistors and circuit boards and the like, you know, that women maybe would traditionally be blocked from that. But we're actually building upon this, this strange situation, this unique advantage of they're at home and they're sitting with this energy system and they become energy entrepreneurs and actually can charge a neighbor's cell phone for 25 cents. And that is um, not only in, you know, providing a, a zero carbon way for them to you know, get access to this power, but they're also becoming entrepreneurs and, and really helping themselves out of poverty. So unfortunately, we're out of time, uh, but I want to thank the members of the panel. And I think we saw a really interesting perspective where we saw uh, 
technology and innovation and entrepreneurship addressing two very different ends of uh, the, uh, I'll call it the density spectrum. We have, uh, we have Roman providing tools for people in the densest of cities to understand how pollutants are affecting them. And we have, uh, we have Mike who's showing us, uh, who's demonstrating this vision of, of microgrid storage and illustrating the, the Al Gore vision of the, of, the, of the green entrepreneur and how in these developing economies, which we, which we learned in the earlier panel, are so critical to how they're, that they grow in a sustainably, uh, uh, in a sustainable way that, you, that, that current costs and current technology can allow those economies to grow and, and that, that, uh, that solar power is cost competitive against uh, any uh, conventional uh, power source in, 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 uh, at various scales in those economies. So thank you very much for illustrating uh, uh, the, uh, the opportunities that technology can have in helping us affect the, uh, the climate change. Okay. So I have the uh, difficult task to give a few words of conclusion after this very exciting uh, discussions and presentations. Um, well, I think the scientific evidence is now overwhelming. Climate change is a serious global threat, and it requires an urgent global response. We know that global warming itself and its dramatic consequences are continuing. Climate change already affects the vital components of people's life, such as access to water, food production, health, biodiversity, and the environment at large. I feel personally concerned by these issues, not only as a world citizen or in my capacity of a counselor of science and, uh, for science and technology, but also because of my scientific background, which has been reminded by Philippe, uh, which is in agronomy and biology. And as a scientist, I spent more than 20 years elaborating procedures to test the impact of environmental, environmental changes on beneficial insects, such as honeybees, trying to protect them against side effects of human activities. Unfortunately, today in Europe as well as in the United States, we face the decline of domestic and wild bee populations, and climate change will increase these neg negative impacts on biodiversity and the consequences on plant pollination. So today, risk for people, economies, and ecosystems are much Greeter, in a world where greenhouses, greenhouse sorry, gas emissions have been continuously rising. From all these perspectives, the economic and technical evidences lead to a simple conclusion. The benefits of strong and early action far outweigh the economic cost of not acting. Smart policies to manage and reduce the risks of climate change must be fair, embracing the importance of history and local cultures, capabilities and balanced financing. 2015 is a turning point for significant improvement. The window for economical feasible solutions with a reasonable objective of holding warming to two degrees Celsius or less is very narrow. As we all know, there is no simple solution yet. Protecting the environment needs a global approach but policymakers need to have reliable information about the magnitude of environmental damage, the processes involved, and the range of potential solutions in order to implement appropriate environmental policies. Therefore, science and technology have more than ever <clears throat> a crucial responsibility to help filling the gaps in knowledge, proposing options for solutions, informing the public, and supporting the policy process. This is what we have been doing tonight at the Exploratorium. Science is a foundation for smart decision to be brought at the forthcoming climate conference in Paris and beyond, as well as all the concrete initiatives being developed by the private sector or the local governments or the NGOs in order to facilitate the transition to a low carbon economy and underpin the commitment countries make or will make. These initiatives are gathered in the so-called ag agenda for solution of solutions. At its humble level, tonight's events, which is part of the FACTS initiative, 
also contributes to the agenda of solutions since it aims at mobilizing the public opinion throughout North America on climate change issues and at reinforcing the conversation between experts from both sides of the Atlantic. So as a conclusion, at the embassy, we are often asked, do you think the COP21 will be a success or failure? First, it is not all in France's hands, but it will be a collective decision, France being only the facilitator in this issue. Second, the COP21 is not the end, but the beginning of, a new, of new avenues to face this global, global challenge. Third, we, the scientists, know that we are already beyond the point where irreversible consequences will occur. But again, there is no place for pessimism. We must implement all adapted solutions in developed as well as in developing countries. There is only one planet. We are all in the same boat, fundamentally interdependent, and we need to enhance our level of cooperation and solidarity. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Mina. Um, if you allow me, um, so this is over for tonight. Um, putting together an event like this one uh, takes a whole team, of course, uh, but tonight sometimes the, this team, um, one particular person um, makes about 80 or 85% of the whole work. And tonight I'd like to, Pierre, can you join us on stage? There's a man who did most of the organization here in San Francisco, where's Pierre? Join us on stage, please. This guy <laughs> was in charge. Uh, so thank you very much, Pierrick, for the amazing work that you did. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you all for staying that, that late and a glass of wine. Thank you.